Thank you so much for joining us today. And today uh, we're going to talk about composting and the role of uh, compost starters and also how you got interested in composting. Uh, looking at the scenario in India, we know that urban India produces about 42 million tons of municipal solid waste annually. Now, municipal solid waste in India comprises approximately 45 to 60 percent of biodegradable organic matter, which is material which can be composted. Food waste that is not composted is quite obviously sent to the landfill and it rots there anaerobically. Anaerobic is that which does not get oxygen and it is just rotting because it's compacted. It causes a negative impact on the environment by releasing methane, which is a harmful greenhouse gas that is 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And of course, it also generates leachate, which is a highly toxic liquid that severely pollutes surface and groundwaters. Coming to you, we would like to hear from you about where did your interest in composting start from? Well, as I told you, I was first bothered by the uh, terrible impact of uh, stray dogs feeding on highway roadside waste dumps and terrorizing travelers, farmers, villagers. So my journey, like most people, was, uh, you know, this is not the place for garbage. Find a better place to put it. And I spent a lot of time trying to help them find another place to dump it. But uh, along the way, as I mentioned, Captain J.S. Velu came from Chennai to introduce the Exnora concept of doorstep collection of separated wet and dry waste, which they did very effectively. <clears throat> Their objective was to give a more uh, clean, hygienic, decent, and more profitable uh, livelihood to the waste because if they could get clean dry waste at the doorstep unmixed with food waste. So I said, yeah, that's all fine. What do you do with the food waste in Chennai? So he said, we dump that in the municipal bin. And where does that go? It goes to the dumping ground. So that didn't seem like a suitable solution. And I began to research what do people do or should do with food waste if you can get it separate like the ex-NORA plan, which is actually now India's solid waste management rules. In the course of that reading, I came across a, a Business India, I think, article with a photograph of a gentleman holding a giant oblong watermelon, elbow to elbow. And it was Kaka Shroff, Kanti Sen Shroff, the chairman at that time of Excel Industries, who mentioned <clears throat> how he was composting municipal waste and uh, uh, developing biocultures to speed up the process. So as I mentioned, when Velu and I and Sandhu went on the Clean India campaign, 30 cities in 30 days by road, we stopped at Bombay to meet Kakashrav. His office was at the edge of their campus, not in the tall executive tower, but a small tiled shed, which was a former stable. And behind that, along the wall, was a trough in which Kakashrav Everyone called him Kaka, uncle. Uh, he was doing experiments. He explained to us that uh, it would take ages and ages to try and get the entire Indian population to separate its wet and dry waste. So let's begin with seeing what we can do with the waste we get, mixed waste, and how to best uh, manage that. So his method was to take this and spray it with composting biocultures. This is a mixture of organisms that would break down the organic matter as happens naturally in nature. And never mind the plastic paper and glass that happens to be in there also. It can be screened out from the decomposed material of which the fines can be used as compost. So uh, he uh, explained the need for the biocultures. Uh, waste can rot in two ways. Uh, if it's in a thin layer like leaves on a forest floor with uh, lots of oxygen available to the thin layer, then it uh, 
decomposes aerobically without smell, without methane, eventually ending up as carbon dioxide and water and releasing no leachate. But if you have a huge dump of it, of which the inside is anaerobic and no air can reach it, then uh, it, in the absence of oxygen, the same organic matter uh, decomposes anaerobically without oxygen, uh, releasing methane, CH4, instead of CO2. And uh, a liquid leachate is released. If you take a rotten tomato and put it on a windowsill in a week, it will dry to a powder. You can crush it. If you put the same similar tomato inside a plastic bag without oxygen, keep it for the same length of time in the same place. When you pick it up, you'll get a bag full of stinky liquid, which is what leachate is. Highly polluting for surface and groundwater. So, so are biocultures uh, absolutely necessary uh, as per you in uh, whether it is, uh, you know, in uh, mixed waste uh, composting or uh, uh, even home composting? Wait, wait. Yeah. <clears throat> this, there's been a lot of, or there used to be a lot of debate about this uh, because a lot of the composting literature came from the West where in temperate climates, the waste does not decompose as rapidly as it does in India. You know, in India, sort of dal can sort of spoil between lunch and dinner if you're not careful. So he felt that in order to drive the uh, decomposition in the right direction, milk also, for example, it can either make dai, which is what we consider a beneficial root. The milk doesn't care, nor do the microbes. We care how its end product is. Or it can curdle and spoil. The milk is kept out. It will turn sour and unusable for us. And it's the, the same time, the same thing. <laughs> The difference is when we want the, we add a starter of uh, beneficial microbes, which will help it turn into the. So in the same way, he felt that in the West, the waste does not decompose that fast. So they don't feel the need for biocultures. But in India, where putrefaction rotting is so rapid, we can't wait for the 1, 2, 4, 8, 16 hours or days for building up a sufficient quantity of microbes to break down the waste. We need to start with a few hundred, a few thousand, a few million and get started. And that's what composting biocultures are. And the composting process requires two sets of microbes. The first ones operate at a very high temperature. When you have a huge heap of rotting waste, uh, the temperature will rise quite rapidly up to 50, 60, 70. So all those thermophilic, which means heat-loving microbes, will go to work breaking it down. And after that, after three, four days, the temperature plateaus and then drops. And the, the heat-loving microbes don't have the temperature they need. The mesophilic or medium heat microbes take over and continue with further decomposition. So the compost biocultures have a bit of both so that they can take turns when that time comes. But how does one select these? Uh, you know, how do you make a selection, especially if you're not an expert in microbiology and you're not expert in, uh, you know, you don't know about it, but you're trying to manage, uh, say, for example, a community composting heap or even trying to assist on, uh, say, landfill management for a municipality. How how does the selection of microbes happen? Well, or the compost starters for that uh, matter. Once the concept of uh compost starters or biocultures took root in India. There were a whole lot of people who piled onto the bandwagon and decided they could make it just as good as anyone else. And uh, uh, I recommend now basically based on uh, performance. And I'll explain how the performance can be evaluated. Uh, there are uh, two kinds of uh, biocultures. Uh, one is for the aerobic route, where the temperature goes up with those thermophilic bacteria. And the simplest way is to just uh, push your hand into a heap and see if you can count to 10. If it's really a good bioculture and the temperature has gone up well, then you really can't keep your hand in there for more than a, one or two counts. Uh, 
and after a few days when you put your hand in again or a thumb, digital thermometer if you wish which very few people use uh, the uh, temperature will drop down and that's the time to turn the heap and let the inside anaerobic core also get some oxygen and again the temperature rises so a graph of that will show you a peak and then when you turn a lower peak and then after turning a lower peak and then finally a very small peak and then you are done after four turnings or so when everything that could decompose by producing high heat is uh, done with and all the mesophilics have done their job so monitoring the temperature is uh, to my mind the best way of uh, seeing how well the biocultures work but this requires daily plotting and preferably with a digital thermometer and they are very sensitive thermometers in a thin brass tube with a thermocouple inside at the tip so you need to use a, a steel rod you know a reinforcement bar or something of similar diameter push it into the heap make a deep hole and remove that and then push in your brass bar so you don't uh, use the, and ruin the brass bar of the instrument to dig into the waste mm -hmm. so therm temperature mapping is the best way really but there is another third way we've heard of uh, composting we've heard of biogas which is anaerobic you put something into a biogas reactor and capture the uh, the biogas that comes out which is compostable with some co2 in it but uh, there is a third kind of bioculture which people recommend which is for fermentation route and that is uh, contains uh, lactobacillus mainly so when you use those uh, fermenting biocultures uh, the common name is em or that kind of or versions of the same so em stands for effective microorganisms uh, japanese uh, origin name for these things you will find that the temperature goes up goes up stays up stays up stays up and it never comes down which is the indication for a turning even if you turn you again get the temperature up 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 hot 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 it stays hot and <clears throat> what the material which you get at the end it does not release leachate it does not release methane but what you get is not compost you get pickle so the dark pickled lemon peels okay it won't become uh, powdery spreadable or right yeah yeah bokashi bokashi yes that is a bokashi. powdered form of the same microbes <clears throat> on wheat bran instead of uh, multiplied in molasses liquid or something like that but then in the second so, stage it still needs to go into an uh, it, does, in it a, doesn't uh, produce compost as such not not easily maybe when you leave it aside to cure <clears throat> then the natural aerobic thermophilic microbes kick in and do their job <clears throat> and then the mesophiles and then how do you judge that the quality of the compost is good uh, is it still mm -hmm. uh, uh, curing is it um, uh, is it a good quality compost ready to be used in the you know for example public parks or private parks or for vegetation or for farming uh, the whole secret is in the temperature of the material uh, it takes usually a month i've heard claims that it can come down to 21 days even 18 days are claimed to decompose the thing uh, but you know that when humans eat food or cows are fed uh, you know the waste doesn't come out in 5 minutes so anything like that like the 24 hour composters claim yes so uh, it takes its own time natural time for the succession of microbes to work <clears throat> so the best way to know if a compost is ready for use on the land is to see whether seeds will germinate in it so you take uh, two vatis or thalis in one you fill your compost which you want to use or bag in the other you take any garden soil red soil or anything like that and in each thali you put an exact counted equal number of seeds 50 or 100 seeds of ragi or mustard or wheat or celery seeds they use in the west and so on and cover it with a lightly sprinkled layer of the same either compost in one or soil in the other and sprinkle it very lightly with a you know baby watering can and after 3 4 days you will get uh, germination you know people grow wheat grass in their home i think quite common so 
uh, you can count mm -hmm. how many little green seedlings uh, or saplings sprouted out in the garden soil. Maybe 90% of the 100 seeds. And in the compost, if it's a good compost, you should similarly get 90, 85 or so. If you get 30, 40 or less, 20, 10 or none, what it means is that the compost has not matured enough and heat is still being generated while being sprinkle watered and decomposing. And that heat will kill the, sterilize the seeds, won't allow them to germinate. Mm -hmm. So again, it's a temperature factor, but the seeds speak for us instead of a thermometer. Yes. And it's a very simple and guaranteed way. What we're doing is putting something for plants to grow. We have to see if the plants like it or don't like it. That's the simplest way for compost quality because the, uh, the rules for marketing compost are extremely complex. You have to uh, draw samples every day, a specific protocol for pool samples, send them regularly for analysis for 20 parameters, uh, including about, uh, you know, 16 heavy metals and other things. And really repeated tests have shown uh, you don't have that much of all those heavy metals. The one uh, metal which comes out higher than it should be in the standards is lead. And those were in the early days for uh, journey in waste management and composting when there was leaded fuel. So the exhaust gases spurting onto the road dust, which then got swept to the side and fallen leaves. And when all that ended up in the dumping ground. When that was composted, that lead from leaded fuels uh, would show up as a, a spike in the lead, which shouldn't be there. But India is more or less completely off leaded fuels nowadays. And so the lead, even if it is a bit higher, is, uh, is not as high as it used to be. And I think not worrisome, it won't enter the food chain at alarming levels or harm us. So I am going to take this uh, a little uh, further and for the benefit of people who are doing community composting. And sometimes there is labor is hard to find. You have just about so many hands and feet on the ground to manage the daily waste and just put it in the bins, let alone, you know, put in a thermometer and map it and then turn it accordingly. In your estimate, uh, for example, in a span of 30 days or 40 days, which is uh, the kind of time it would regularly take uh, for the compost to settle down or to you know to be uh, to become mature. to mature to to maybe become compost and then maybe another two weeks or so to mature i, I think in my experience but yeah. how many uh, how many times do you think in these 30 days this pile should be turned and at what intervals would it be once a week once in you see, there's a very interesting new development uh, for home composting as well as community composting. It may be too expensive for a whole city's uh, dumping ground. And that is cocoa peat. The reason you have to turn a pile is because... Uh, when you have a big heap, oxygen can only penetrate the outer six or eight inches of that heap, which means you will always have an anaerobic core, a smaller triangle inside the big one. And the purpose of turning is to let that anaerobic material also inside out and outside in get an exposure to oxygen and a chance for aerobic composting. Uh, if you don't do that, and you don't turn, then that anaerobic core will take its own oxygen-free route of methane and leachate, and you will see black liquid trickling out from the heat. Yeah. If you see liquid trickling out, that's a sign it needs turning. And if you don't turn or want to avoid turning, there's a very interesting new development called cocoa peat, which is the powder from... Uh, you know, the outer husk of the coconut. And they add the same composting biocultures to that after an acid wash and so on to make it acceptable for plants. And the cocoa pit can absorb, uh, I think, 300% moisture compared to its weight. Is this, uh, you compare it to leaves or? Uh... Leaves, leaves don't absorb that much moisture, mm -hmm. but cocoa pit is a huge sponge-like structure which absorbs a huge amount of liquid, in this case, leachate. Mm -hmm. So it absorbs the leachate, which is an organic-rich liquid, and it holds it there till that 
stuff gets a chance to be composted and biodegraded also. Yes. So if you use cocoa peat in layers, and the secret is thin layers, layers thin enough that oxygen can reach to the furthest part, mm. then you don't need any turning at all. Yes. And that would be a good option for communities which can afford to purchase cocoa peat uh, rather than use the readily available leaves because I think always... No, the, the leaves are necessary and useful mm. because if you see... Uh, just pure kitchen waste in your dustbin without plastics or paper. It doesn't have any air spaces in it. Yeah. How will the oxygen even get through the six or eight inches if it's all filled with uh, moisture from the food yes. and has no air pores? Yes. So uh, the leaves help to uh, give you a more porous structure for allowing the oxygen to get in. Also the carbon material, I mean, that's where the carbon also comes from. Right? Yes. yes. So, yes, that's that's uh, very useful, I think, even for people who are doing community composting and not just uh, looking at large uh, landfills where introduction of microbes could actually help to break down uh, the organic material, which should ideally have not reached the landfill or not have reached those piles uh, yeah. of mixed waste. So I would like to mention here uh, a beautiful uh, effort in Bangalore uh, in HSR layout where there is a compost learning center or they call it Kalika Kendra. Yes. They've taken a public park and in a part of it uh, put up a covered uh, open fronted uh, shed <laughs> where there are about a dozen different options of composting. Buckets with perforations, clay pots with perforations clay pots one above the other to be rotated, daily dump, mm -hmm. and so many other models. And in the open part of the park, they have a community composting demos, cylinders which can be rotated by hand or uh, vertical cylinders in which material can be placed in layers with the cocoa peat and so on, 50 to 500 kilos, one ton at a time. So members of the public or even the officers or small town people who want to learn about the different options can go and look there. All the suppliers names and addresses are provided, but not prices that you write to each company and find out for yourself. Oh, that's a wonderful mm. initiative, and I think it's being managed by SWMRT. Is yeah. yeah, there is a Dr. Shanti uh, living in HSR, who's, I think, the main driver behind it. And she has taken this model and got it replicated in Siddipet, I believe. I haven't visited yet. Yeah. And uh, uh, we had taken one director of municipal administration to see it of Bangalore. And he felt it was a wonderful thing and every district in Karnataka should have one. But that was a burst of enthusiasm and didn't really go anywhere. Oh, it's, it's good. I think it's the pride of India because we, we have so little of this across India. There should be lovely films which should be circulated pan India for those who cannot visit physically and see it. Uh, one more question now that we are talking about uh, community composting and microbes is that I notice very often, uh, you know, we, we are in, in uh, Gurgaon, we have temperatures like we've had temperatures close to 35 to 40, 40 to 45 degrees here in the past few days. And the moment we get food waste, food waste is sometimes over a day old. And when it comes to us and we put it in our bins, uh, initially, even though, you know, we use a lot of leaves, we notice that there is a huge generation of um, uh, liquid that you know that comes out from the piles because of maybe because of the rotting food and uh, the inability of the leaves to totally absorb you've already sp spoken about cocoa peat but is there any other way that the microbes can help to arrest this issue of the excessive liquid that's generated and specifically in the first few days in the first four to five days of uh, the bin being uh, filled with uh, the well, waste. This is a very big problem in cities 
which have decided to over mechanize their waste collection, mm -hmm. where they will have huge, uh, you know, one, two, five cubic meter metal containers with sloping lids and a, a crane picks it up, puts it on lorry and takes it to the dumping ground and brings the empty ones back in its place. And in the heart of the city or in markets, those containers will fill in a few hours, half a day or so. They may need two collections. In uh, outlying parts where the population is not so dense, that bin will not fill for two, three days. So the city says, oh, we have to economize on fuel and, uh, you know, uh, minimize our trips. So we will only pick up those bins every third day or so. And the waste and nature is not going to wait for its rotting. Stop. So it will start in this closed covered bin to begin anaerobic decomposition and generate the leachate. Once the leachate is out there, it's a different matter. You can separate the leachate from the solid and treat the leachate with different biocultures, specific biocultures. But uh, you can't stop the leachate coming out or you can't really treat a mix of solid and liquid once it comes to you in a mess. Yeah. So the, the answer is prevention, not cure. Okay. So essentially not to ensure that it's not coming in an anaerobic it should, uh, Yeah, because and it's not uh, left I, to be for more than one day. Exactly. Max. Max. Yeah. Okay. The solution which uh, neither composting nor fermentation nor biogas, which uh, Velo Srinivasan is promoting and Ambikapur has adopted is within the first six hours, uh, any food waste, kitchen waste, is uh, excellent animal feed. So if you can collect the peels and you know the uncooked uh, kitchen waste and give it straight away to animals, cattle, goats, sheep, anything, uh, that's a beautiful way. Yes. And inside a cow's stomach, you certainly have a 24 hour composter. Yes. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> manure is a beautiful product. Oh, yes. So in Ambikapur, they have a, a decentralized, uh, in, in Velour, for instance, they have five ton per day composting bins and a dry waste sorting and recycling facility. In Ambikapur, they have uh, cattle, ducks, chickens uh, in each of these ward locations. And the food comes quickly and fresh to the animals, which gobble it up very happily. Yes, we've seen that with you. Yeah. So lovely. It's been really nice learning about uh, microbes from you and compost starters. And we hope that... Uh, more and more people can look at the intervention of compost starters specifically when they're doing uh, large amounts of food waste composting to a not just to enhance the quality of the compost but also to enhance the speed at which composting happens many people and i've also often recommended either you use cow dung instead of a compost starter it's a natural uh, yeah mixture of every kind of so microbes. Slurry. When you say cow dung, we make a slurry and use that as uh, just a, a wash. 5%, a five percent dilution, a urine colored dilution of it. Because you do not want the kind of paste that you plaster your floors or walls with in a village house, yeah. which is the undigested hay that, you know, is bound by the other material. If you have just a 5% solution, like a, a one or two fistfuls in a 20 liter bucket of water, then you have all the microbes that you want without the hay and the straw getting in the way. And you just sprinkle that. You need moist, but not wet. Yes. You need moisture so that there are enough air spaces in your 
stockpile for the oxygen to reach every particle. If you have it waterlogged, all the air spaces will be filled with water and you'll not get compost. Yes, you'll again yes. get an anaerobic condition. So maybe this is also very good to use specifically when you're doing horticulture composting is to just, uh, because yes. horticulture will also no, not- And eat. also on a pile of dry leaves, if you sprinkle them with this uh, dilute cow dung solution and preferably fresh cow dung, which is full of microbes, not, uh, you know, right. those cakes dried on the wall where the microbes are half dead. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, many people uh, in home composting use their own older compost or the coarser part of the older compost back again, which is also effective, not as absorbent as cocoa peat, uh, maybe little better than leaves, but uh, that compost will not have the uh, thermophilic microbes, which have flourished in very high heat and died out. It will have more of the mesophils, the lower temperature digesters. So is it a good idea to add the compost specifically when you're turning in the, say, third week or so, when the still some undigested material as a part of the pile and it's still wet and you don't want to add the leaves because leaves are not going to uh, decompose in time and in time yeah. and then add the the pre you know the compost from a previous the coarse uh, compost from earlier that would be a good idea yeah mm. yeah instead of sawdust which is difficult to get and you have to go somewhere, buy a bag full, have space for keeping it, sprinkling it, all that. What is your opinion on um, on uh, uh, wood wood chips for composting? In well, in contrast to leaves or cocoa peat. Well, that's what I was uh, talking about. That either sawdust or wood chips, uh, they provide you the carbon, and they are dry but they do not absorb as well as cocoa peat and they don't absorb as well as old compost does. Yes. So, and their breakdown speed would also be uh, maybe slower. Very much that. slower. Very, very slower. much slower. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. This has been a very, very informative session and uh, we hope lots of people can start their composting journeys and get it right yeah. with microbes. But I think the best. I have to mention it. composting is an art and a science, just like cooking. Absolutely. People can't read a recipe book and turn out, uh, you know, grandma's super specialties. That's an <laughs> art. I agree with you. So you can write as many manuals, but till you don't do yeah. it and get your hands dirty and, and experiment and learn for yourself. And it changes with yeah. the sun. It's hot. Change it. Yeah. <laughs> it's cold. You change it. So, yes, yes, it's true. It's a very nice book by Savita Hiramath called Endlessly Green. I think if anyone wants to seriously educate themselves on composting, a lot of what I've said, she's uh, spelt out in great detail. detail. Personal experience added with philosophy, spirituality, and <laughs> morality, and uh, eco friendliness, and everything else. And a lovely blog too, which has a lot of uh, comparisons of different types of composting. So lovely. Let's conclude this session with this. And thank you so much for again, again, for sharing uh, so much uh, wisdom, knowledge, experience, and uh, little bits of uh, fun facts. So <laughs> till we meet again. Okay. Bye.